yesterday in the last class, we covered um, the pre-listing package, um, locating sellers, right? How to move them into an appointment for qualified sellers. And as I mentioned in that appointment or in that lesson, just because somebody is not quite ready yet to sell, um, if you are fairly certain that they're moving that direction, it may be worth spending some time and you may want not want to spend as much time as you would in a full listing presentation or dropping off the pre-listing packet. But that would be a good opportunity to schedule a time just to do a quick walkthrough of their property, talk with them about some things they can do to prepare their house for sale so that when they are ready to make that move, their house is also ready for that move. And in addition, it gives you that opportunity to begin building relationship and rapport. So, um, oh, hold on. Give me just a second. I'm going to fix my window. Really bright outside. I think I'm going to end up having to move my desk. All right. So I don't have to close my windows. All right. So anyways, so it may be worth that time to do that quick walkthrough with them, give them some action items of things to do to prepare their home for sale, but not spend a ton of time there. Just talk with them, build that that relationship and rapport. And with any time you meet with somebody, I always recommend that you set that time that you're going to connect with them next. So if it was somebody that's like, man, we're really thinking like six, nine months down the road, we might be ready to sell. We want to get the kids through summer or whatever that might be. Um, then you want to take that time and figure out, okay, when does it make sense to connect with them? Don't wait six months to connect with them. Set that appointment to do the walkthrough and then you're going to schedule time, maybe like once a month or so, where you'll just touch base with them and see how things are going, um, you know, and just follow up. So you kind of always want to have that plan in place for that. So um, that being said, we're going to dive in to the listing or presentation itself. So remember, you've dropped off the pre-listing presentation with them. Um, I usually drop off a CMA report or a comparative market analysis. <laughs> And I also drop off copies of the documents like the listing agreement, the seller property questionnaire, the um, transfer disclosure statement, not for them to fill out and sign, just so that they are made aware of the items that will be coming down the pipeline for them to complete. In addition, when I got off the phone with them to confirm that appointment, I let them know that they may want to have a key ready to go um, for the lockbox, right? We talked about a little bit of homework they should do to prepare for our appointment. So now we're actually showing up for the appointment. Please make sure you arrive on time. Please don't be late to a listing appointment. It does not look good. You also don't wanna be like 15, 20 minutes early because chances are those sellers are in that house frantically trying to make it clean because now they're assuming you're the buyer for the property and it must be spotless. Um, sometimes when I set my listing appointments, I let people know like, hey, don't worry about picking up the house or making it spotless. Like, I'm not here to judge your housekeeping skills. I'm just coming. We're going to talk about what this process is looking like of moving your home to be market ready, right? So I kind of set them up for that. They're still going to frantically try to clean their house before you show up. So don't show up too early. You really want to be like two or three minutes ahead of time, not 15. And you definitely don't want to be late. All right, today we're going to talk about the listing appointment and tips for winning sellers and securing the listing. As always, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Or I do, I did, I don't currently have the, oh, there's the chat box. I do have the chat box open. So um, if you can throw something in the chat box as well, and I'll be able to see it. Although sometimes there's a delay there. So um, the listing process right? You've, um, this is the moment of truth. You've utilized that pre-listing questionnaire. So we've asked them some questions. We dug into why are they moving? When are they planning to move? Um, you know, what they thought their home value was worth. Remember I told you that was a really important question to, to ask them and to get an answer for on what they thought their market value of their home was so that you have an idea when you look at that comparative market analysis and you start having that conversation about pricing of whether they're going to be super excited or whether they're going to be really bummed. Okay. I always, just so you know, if I go into it and the seller's like, man, I really think it's um, you know, we're 620. And when I pull comps, I'm really thinking I can probably get 640, 650 for it. 
that gives me an opportunity to not say, hey, let's throw it on the market at 650, but you know, kind of prep them that let's throw it on the market at like 630, 635, right? Maybe a little higher than what they were thinking, but not as high as I quite think it can get so that we can get more buyers through the door and hopefully drive that price higher, right? So um, my pricing strategy is generally the same, but it is going to vary just a little bit based on the expectations of the seller. So you did that pre-listing questionnaire. Remember, one of the other questions in that pre-listing questionnaire was, are you interviewing other agents? And then I said, I would add if they said yes, am I the first agent you're talking to in the middle, the last, and how many other agents are you talking to, right? So that way I kind of know what the lineup looks like. I've done my research and preparation. I understand their house. I know their floor plan. I've looked at old pictures of it. I know what updates they've done. I know what condition they say the house is in. I've driven by the front of it already so that I know that what the landscaping looks like, right? And I've dropped off that pre-listing package and I asked them to review it. So now I'm showing up to walk in the door. And I really apologize today. I am not feeling well. Apparently I was not feeling well yesterday either because I got off our training yesterday and I felt like I was a little discombobulated and had problems focusing. And then last night at about 10 30, all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, Oh, I'm sick. So I apologize for being sick. We're going to conduct the listing appointment, right? Knock on the door. Hi, Amy Petard. I'm here for our listing appointment. How are you today? Um, I highly recommend there's something special about the kitchen table. So if they have a kitchen table, they invite you in. If they offer you a glass of water, please say yes. It's polite and it helps to build, again, that relationship and rapport. It puts you guys on the same level. So always say yes to water, even if you just take a couple of sips of it and you have a thing against drinking out of other people's cups. Um, totally okay, but take the water, take a couple sips. Um, ask if maybe you can put your stuff down on the kitchen table, right? If they have one, if not, um, figure out kind of where you're going to be sitting and talking about this. Our goal isn't to walk straight in and start the presentation. When I walk in the door of the house, my first goal is going to be to do a quick walkthrough of the property. Okay. So I want to do that home tour. I would recommend bringing with you some homework for them. Okay. I really don't want the sellers following me around during the home tour. I want to view that property like I would with a buyer. And so I'm going to communicate to that to them. Hey, to start out, do you mind if I do a quick walkthrough of your property? Um, I've got a couple of things that I need you to take care of while I'm doing that. And that'll just give me the ability to be able to walk through the property as if I'm a buyer, right? Where you're not going to be there to tour all the buyers through the property. And I just kind of want to walk through it as a buyer would. I'm going to make some notes of things that maybe we should change up or make adjustments to. Um, things to be aware of as I walk through the property as well. Does that sound good? And they're gonna be like, okay. And you're like, I've got some homework for you. Here's this piece of paper. And I'm gonna have you write down um, the top features of your home. What do you like about this home? What should buyers be aware of? You know, have them sit down while you're doing that walkthrough and kind of making that list of what the updates, the upgrades, features, what they love about the neighborhood, right? So there could be a whole questionnaire that you make up that has them fill in that information. Um, I actually have a Google form that I created um, that has all of the information on it that I need for the MLS listing that I send them after we're done. But on the front part of that form, that's what it's asking. Like, what are your favorite features of the property? Um, you know, are there anything that, you know, buyers should be aware of? How old's the water heater? How old's the roof? How old's the HVAC system? Um, is everything working properly? Is the water tank double strapped, right? That's a good time to ask that question is when they're sitting there filling it out because they're gonna be like, I don't know if our water heater's double strapped. We should go check, right? So then they're gonna go look and see or they can ask you while you're standing there, right? You're getting all this information from them. The more that you can get buy-in from potential sellers, um, then the more likely they're going to go with you because you're creating buy-in and creating yourself as the industry expert. Oh, the other agent we talked to, they didn't have us fill out all this stuff. She really cares about our property. Um, Claudia, I will find my Google form. It's been a little while since I've accessed it and I will definitely share it with you um, later on. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so you're going to do that home tour. 
And then you're going to move into the presentation, including marketing and pricing strategies. And then you're going to close for the listing. So when I walk in, I'm going to greet, get that glass of water. If they offer it, if they don't offer it, I'm not necessarily going to ask for it. Set my stuff down, explain that I'd like to do a quick walkthrough of the property before we do our presentation or before we talk about the next steps in the listing process and ask them to complete their homework. That's kind of my first step in the listing. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right, as I'm walking through that property, um, I am going to be making notes of the property, right? So I'm going to be looking at, as I walk down into the bedrooms, like is the bed shoved all the way up against the wall? Can we pull it away from the wall? Do they have four dressers in a room? Maybe we need to clean some of those out. I usually do peek into the closets to just see how clean they are so that I can make the recommendation that they should start packing and decluttering those closets because people will look inside cabinets and closets. Um, we're going to talk about maybe if I see some minor things that need repaired, you know, I walk into the bathroom and it's obvious that like the shower needs to be recalled. That's one of the main things in the bathroom. Um, then, you know, we might make that recommendation to them. So I'm just going to make a little list of everything, including like before I even knock on the doors, I'm walking up to their property or as I'm sitting in the car waiting for the clock to tick away to that like special three minute mark before the actual time of the appointment. I may be making some notes about the yard, the curb appeal. Remember, especially that front yard. The backyard, I feel like more people are way more forgiving on the backyard than they are the front yard. The front yard is your first impression. It's also your last impression, right? So it's the first thing people see when they pull up. And it's also the last thing they're thinking about and seeing as they pull away. And oftentimes, you know, agents will stand in front of the house with their clients and have a discussion. So that front yard curb appeals super important. And sometimes it's as simple as just adding some flowers to the front porch to add a pop of color. Sometimes maybe the front door needs a fresh coat of paint, right? There could be some little things that need done versus in, you know, full landscaping of the front yard. If the grass is just a pile of weeds, tell them to mow the weeds and you can move on if they don't have a lot of money or time to be able to like replace it with sod or rock or something to that effect. Um, people are forgiving. You just try to make it look as clean as possible. Right. So I'm going to be making these notes for them. I'm going to save them in my phone. I usually like open up a notes in my phone and I just start making notes as I walk through the property so that I can hand those off. Um, once I'm done with the walkthrough, I'm always going to compliment them on their property. Oh my gosh, your property is so cute. And you're right. You did update the bathrooms. You did a super good job, right? So whatever that is, um, I'm going to always try to compliment them because remember, this is an emotional thing for most sellers and they have pride in their home. And even if their home is a crap hole, <laughs> right? Even if it's a disaster, we want to find some good things to point out about it. Okay, um, this would also be a time that I might make suggestions. Um, I might point out like, oh, I made a couple of notes and I'll send those over to you. Things like, you know, in that one bedroom, you had four dressers and we should probably, you know, start packing up some of our stuff because you're going to get ready to move and downsize some of those dressers out because it'll make the room feel more spacious. Or once it comes time to list the property, we may want to rearrange the living room furniture just a little bit so that it creates flow as we move through the house and as people are seeing the property, they don't get stopped by a couch. Um, and I will clean up this list for you after we're done with our appointment and I'll send it over to you. Does that sound good? Right. I don't want to give them all the information that I came up with as I walk through the property, but I want to give them some tidbits to be like, oh, wow, she really knows what she's talking about. And she's going to send us that stuff as soon as we're done here. Right. That way, if they decide that, no, we're not going with you, I don't necessarily have to give them all my tips and tricks to get their house sold. Okay. So I share a little bit, but maybe not everything with them. I do walk out in the backyard. I do go out in the garage. Just so you know, people always ask like, is it okay? Like, you know, we're getting ready to move. You're telling us to pack stuff up. Do we have to rent a storage facility or can we just put stuff in the garage? You can absolutely put stuff in the garage. 95% of buyers don't care what the garage looks like. They expect it to be cluttered, but they want to see the size. So I always recommend to make sure they leave enough space that somebody could walk out into the garage kind of look around if they have a water heater or an HVAC system out there that people can actually get to those systems or to the door that runs to the backyard and that they leave a space between the wall and the boxes. So during the inspection process, those pest inspectors and home inspectors are gonna to wanna to look down that wall line. 
So I advise them to kind of leave things about 12 inches off the wall so that we can see a clean shot of those wall lines um, during the inspection process. But they absolutely can stack stuff. That's usually the best option for moving boxes and preparing to move is to stack it out there in the garage. On occasion, I do have people that have like an extra bedroom in the house and their garage is kind of full and they ask if they can store them in the house someplace. So again, you know, an extra space I usually ask them to put them, start them on the far back corner of the wall. So as you walk in the door, kind of back corner, so that people feel like the room is spacious when they walk in and to stack them nice and neat. And so it looks like an organized packing process instead of just boxes strewn all over the room. Okay. Um, any questions about that walkthrough? All right, proceeding forward. After I know the walkthrough, I would say, well, let's sit down and talk about, you know, kind of what your guys' plans are and about what the next steps would be to, to get your property on the market. And this is where I want to lead with value, right? I'm never going to lead with, well, my name's Amy and I work for Realty One Group and we're like the top company in this and we have the most number of sales and our sales have been up blank and blank and we've got 150 agents and we've got multiple locations across the United States and I'm going to push it out to all these, right? I'm not going to go into that because ultimately... The seller's gonna be like, well, that's great, but do you even care about me? So I'm gonna lead with value. I'm gonna ask questions. Okay. I'm gonna reiterate if we had that conversation on the phone already, like, why are they looking to sell? Oh, so you talked about, you know, you're getting kind of cramped in this home and you're wanting to, to move up into house. Are you wanting to stay in this area? Right. We're just gonna start having a conversation about what their plans are. My goal also during this time is to mirror and match those sellers. So if they're very hesitant, and talking slow, I'm going to slow myself down. I'm going to kind of copy their body language and try to mirror and match to help ease them and set them at ease. If somebody is very timid and emotional and I come at them like, oh my gosh, we're going to do this and this, and we're going to list your property here. And I do all this online marketing and we can price it here. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, that was so overwhelming. That sounded scary. And I'm done. Okay. So we want to mirror and match our clients. So we want to adjust our tone our speed, our body language to match them. If I've got sellers that are like sitting in their chair like this with their arms crossed and like leaning back, I'm probably going to do the same thing to start the conversation. And as I start getting them to answer questions and open up, I'm going to slowly lean myself forward and uncross my arms. Chances are they are also going to go ahead and uncross their arms once I do mine, because it's going to help to diffuse them and help them to feel at ease. So just kind of keep that in mind and pay attention. Also pay attention to the type of answers that you're getting and the type of questions that the sellers are asking, because that's going to give them some insight into their personality profile, right? How do they communicate? What kind of information do they want? Are they like highly analytical and they want to go through every item on the listing presentation, right? Or are they like a high D, a driver, and they just want to get to the end of it? Like if you go through every page of this item, word for word, item for item, you're going to drive them insane, right? So you kind of want to see what kind of person they are and what kind of questions they're asking to figure out how much information these people really want in order to be able to move forward. Okay, we're going to ask questions. We're going to um, dive into their reason for selling, their why. We're going to figure out what's important to them, right? so that we can keep that top of mind and that we can keep coming back to those things that are important to our sellers. What's important to one seller is gonna vary from seller to seller. You do wanna go into a little bit about yourself and the company. And again, you're gonna kind of take that on a seller by seller basis as well on how in depth to go into that. Again, if you've got somebody that's highly analytical or maybe even like a super social personality, they may find it super interesting that we have X number of thousands of agents across the United States and this many offices and that we have a network that we can throw the listing out to and try to find buyers from other areas. And, you know, here's our marketing strategy. They're going to find that pretty interesting where your high D may not find that as interesting. They just want you to get their house sold. Okay. And then you also want to help the seller think like a buyer. Okay. That um, pricing or the pre-listing presentation that I dropped off when I first sit down with them, I'm going to ask them, did you have a chance to look through the information that I dropped off for you a couple days ago? 
And they're gonna be like, oh yeah, we did, or no, we didn't. And be like, that's okay. I'm always gonna bring another copy of it with me so that I have a copy of it. I'm gonna ask them to grab that if they have it available. And then if they're like, oh yeah, we totally had a chance to go through it. You can be like, oh, perfect. Did you want me to go through the whole thing again with you? Or did you just have questions that you wanted me to answer? Or maybe you just want to highlight, right? So maybe it's like, oh, let me just highlight some of the things to make sure that you fully understood all the information that was in there, right? So you can decide based on your seller and their personality, how in depth you want to go into that. But that's going to be my guideline for my seller presentation is using that same information that I already dropped off with them. Okay, at the listing appointment, I try not to introduce new information. Okay. Um, we are going to walk through that presentation. It talks about, you know, who I am. It talks about um, different pricing strategies. It talks about your marketing strategies in there. So you're going to talk about how you're going to market their home for sale. If you're going to do open houses, how you're going to market for those open houses, um, you know, if you promote it online, how you would do that, how you pull buyers, listing it on the MLS, taking professional photography. I lost a listing one time because I didn't mention that we had the ability to virtual stage a home. So now in my listing presentation, it has the different options for photography. Like here's our base package. Here's what we do for all properties. But if you're interested in any of these additional items, just let me know. It could be something like drone photography, virtual staging. It also talks about the fact that outside of photography, we do have staging available if they would prefer to do that, right? If the home's going to be vacant or if they want to exchange out some of their furniture for staging furniture, there's lots of options. So I kind of cover that in that packet it is my pre-listing presentation that I drop off to people ahead of time. And then I touch on those items again. Maybe something that is we're talking about the photography. I'm like, our base package is professional photography. You know, they come in, they take front photos, interior photos, back photos. Um, they edit them. We make the property look nice. My goal in photography is that it looks nice to drag people in the door. However, we don't want people to be disappointed when they walk through that door. So we don't want the pictures to show a false presentation of the property either. Um, sometimes we do do drone photography or sometimes we do drone photography in your property. Um, you know, it's just a regular residential lot. It's probably not necessary. Um, it doesn't add to your listing. We don't want to really see how close your neighbors are to your property versus if it was a country property, we would absolutely do drone photography. Or if it's something that's important to you, we can do that. Right. So I'm going to have that conversation with them so they feel like they're being informed. And always, as we move through each section, I'm going to ask them if they have any questions or concerns. Okay. I might ask them, is that important to you? Right. I'm trying to get to the heart of who they are and what they want. When we move into the pricing portion of the presentation, we start talking about pricing, right? We're going to pull out that CMA report that comparative market analysis. I usually just so you know, I usually just call it like a market analysis when I'm talking to clients. I don't call it a comparative market analysis because they get lost in the title. Um, and I may want to bring some pictures, some additional pictures of those properties that were in that CMA report, right? So if um, I picked some properties because again, they told me that they had updated the property or they told me they hadn't, but so I pulled different comps that had updated kitchens versus not updated kitchens and stuff in the middle. So I may want to bring pictures of the different kitchens. So if we run into a discussion of pricing and they're like, man, I really thought it was worth more. You can be like, well, here's the three properties. This one sold at 630. This one sold at 620 and this one sold at 650. Which of these homes do you find most appealing? They're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that one at 650, that one has a beautiful kitchen, right? And then you're gonna be like, how does your kitchen compare to that one, right? They're gonna be like, well, our kitchen's nice, but it's not nearly that nice, yeah. And you're gonna be like, yeah, right? It's closer to this one that was listed at like 630, right? So we're gonna use those as examples to help bring them back to earth if we know their pricing is gonna be a little on the high side. If I know their pricing and what they thought the house was worth is gonna be a little on the low side, then I may not need as much um back up to support the price. I'm going to do the walkthrough and I'm going to readjust kind of what I think the list price is going to be. So when I come with the list price to like on that CMA report, because I hadn't seen the inside of the property, unless you've seen it, I usually do a pretty big range, right? Our range for our market analysis is going to be like, 
hey, your property needs a lot of work. It would be priced here to it's fully updated and renovated. This is where it would be priced. Okay, that's kind of my range I go with unless I've already seen the interior of the property. Sometimes if you can go off what the old pictures were and then talk with them about what updates, we could maybe narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> but when I come into that appointment, after I've done the walkthrough, now I'm like, okay, we're going to be near the mid to upper end of that range or mid to lower end, or we're going to be closer to the lower end. And here's why, right? So I'm going to have that in my head as I'm walking through the property. And then we're going to have that discussion. Like, the homes in your area, what we do is we look at homes that are in the surrounding neighborhood that have sold within the last few months, um, because those are what the appraisers are going to look at. So not only do we have to sell your property to a potential buyer, we also have to sell your property to the appraiser. If the buyer comes in and offers more than what your property is worth, chances are they're going to try to negotiate down. So we need to kind of know where that appraised value is going to land based on that appraisal once we're in contract. Based on the condition of your property, um, we had kind of talked about, you know, there's kind of this range of properties in your neighborhood. They range from 620 up to 650. And based on the condition and updates that you've done, your home's going to fall right in the middle. Is that kind of what you were expecting? And they're going to be like, yeah, that that is absolutely. And you'd be like, perfect. Right. And then we can go into those pricing strategies. We may talk about the total months of inventory that's on the market right now. We may talk about the present competition, I always bring in the active listings and the ones that have just gone into contract as well as the sold properties, right? Because those active ones are the ones that we're competing against. And oftentimes when I walk into a listing appointment and I look at those active listings, I pull active listings that are very similar to their property anywhere in the city or in similar neighborhoods, because that's going to be their competition when they go on the market. Okay, people aren't just probably going to look in their specific neighborhood. They're going to look in the surrounding neighborhoods and all of the city. So we want to know what those properties look like as well. Okay, so present competition, um, months of inventory. Is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? What to expect in offers, right? Like right now, a lot of our offers, even though we're oftentimes getting, if it's priced appropriately, we're getting multiple offers. A lot of our buyers are still asking for closing cost credits to help get those rates down to make their payments more affordable. So even though we may get multiple offers, we may find that all the offers come in with asking for some sort of closing cost credit from you to help them with that. And don't worry, once we get to that point, I'll explain to you kind of what that net offer number looks like to you based on the offers received. Does that make sense? And they'll be like, yeah, okay. You can also go ahead and prep them that, hey, in this market too, in this area, it's customary for the sellers to pay for the transfer tax, it's customary for buyers to pay for their title and escrow fees. And oftentimes our sellers go ahead and throw in a home warranty because happy buyers make for less legal actions after the close of escrow. So for, you know, 550 bucks, 600 bucks, um, it helps just to make those buyers a little bit happy when something pops up after the close of escrow and they don't jump into like, oh my gosh, I'm going after the sellers, right? So it's just a little way to kind of comfort those buyers. Does that make sense? And they'd be like, oh yeah, we don't want to go into that, right? This might also be a good time to discuss the importance of pre-listing inspections and whether you cover the cost of those or whether they would cover the cost and why we would want pre-listing inspections. It helps just to eliminate the unknown when it comes to their property, that their property on the shelf looks very nice and very well upkept. And we just want the inspection to show the same thing or to know what a buyer is going to show up on inspections when they have them done so that we don't have any surprises as we move through the process, right? You're going to be like, does that make sense? And we're like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense, right? Always make sure as you move through this process that you're asking them if they have any concerns, if you ask them if that makes sense, ask them if they have any questions, right? Explain to them why it's important. As we move into that pricing strategy, right? We've talked about the current market. We've talked about the competition. We've kind of talked about where it might fall market value. We can also bring up a graph like this that just talks about, um, you know, on the left-hand side, you have the asking price in relation to market value and the number of potential buyers who are going to look at their property. So if you're like, man, I really think your property is going to sell at like 630-ish. However, that being said, I would like to increase the number of buyers that see your property, hoping to drive up and bring in 
offers on the first week on the market. Or if you're pretty confident, you might get multiple offers. You could also say that hopefully like are with a pricing strategy, we can hopefully bring in multiple buyers, which will actually help us to drive the price up. So as you can see, if we price it at market value, we get about 60% of potential buyers will look at the property versus if we list it a little lower than market value, it starts increasing that number of buyers that are going to see the property. The number of buyers that see it increase the potential for the number of offers. Does that make sense? And then you're like, yeah. You're like, so ultimately, I think it's probably going to sell in the 630 range, but I'd really like to come on the market at 620, right? Because that just, again, that opens up our buyer pool and with the intention that hopefully we can help drive that price higher. Um, does that make sense, right? So we're going to explain that to them to help it price it aggressively. Now, if we're in a buyer's market where we're not getting very many offers, maybe we're anticipating just one offer on the property or that it might be on the, the market for a couple of weeks, then we may price it closer to market value, right? So that when somebody comes in, they're coming in at that market value. I'm still not going to ever price it ahead of market value because you're going to eliminate that buyer pool. The second you go 10% over, um, what would be considered market value, you've dropped your buyer pool in half from 60% to 30% of the potential buyers. So you really drop it when you start overpricing the property. Amy? Yes. Um, so this, does this chart, is it good for if you're in a seller or buyer's market? It doesn't matter. You can always- Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so once I've gotten them to agree on a price and kind of a strategy, we've talked about the marketing, we've talked about where it's going to be listed, we've um, gone over all that stuff, then we're going to start going in to ask for the listing, right? Number one thing is be patient. Don't be like, okay, are you ready to sign now? Right? Cool. Now we have a price. Let's sign the listing agreement. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, that was so scary, right? So again, we're going to ask questions encourage questions, encourage discussion, and include the seller in the decision-making process. Um, you can ask them things like, is there anything, do you have any questions that I haven't answered today? Are there any concerns when it comes to selling your home that have not yet been addressed, right? So we wanna find out if they have any objections, okay? Um, just trying to think I had, as I was saying that I had something that came in my brain and then it went out the other side, but we're, oh, um, you, um, may also talk about as part of that listing presentation. And we've talked about the price. You want to talk about that average days on market. So they know what to expect there as far as, um, how long it should sit on the market. And then you may also want to talk with them about the key indicators that we need to make a price adjustment, right? How do we know we're successful versus not? Like in the first, if during the week, we have lots of showings, but no offers. It's just an indicator of the market. We probably don't need to do anything right away, but if we go kind of 14 days with lots of showings and no offers, then we probably need to pay attention to some feedback and make some adjustments either on the price or a um, sticky item when it comes to the property. If we don't have any showings or very few showings during a week on the market, then that's when we really need to talk about making an adjustment. We're not even getting people through the door. So we may need to make a price adjustment there. However, if we look at the average days on market and see that our average days on market is, you know, most properties are on the market 30 days before going in the contract, we aren't going to panic at 12 days on the market. Okay. And that's what happened back last year about this time was we went from, you know, eight, nine, 10 offers the first weekend on the market to no offers and everybody panicked and were like, oh my gosh, price reductions. It's happening. The market's falling. And it was unnecessary. We just needed to, because that wasn't just like one property. It was all the properties. So we just, everybody kind of needs to take a deep breath and breathe. So if, if all the properties are sitting on the market, then we know that, hey, we just need to hold steady. We need to keep checking comps and stay stay the course versus if other properties are going in the contract and ours is not, then we haven't priced it appropriately. We need to make that pricing adjustment. Okay. So at this point, you've reviewed their motivations. You've talked to them about their timing. We did not address that earlier on, but as we first sit down for the presentation and those questions that we're going to ask, part of that's going to be about timing. 
what does their timing look like? Are they wanting to move as soon as possible? Is there something preventing them? Are they military and they actually don't PCS until the end of summer, right? What does that timing look like? If we sold their house today, would that cause a problem for them? Or if we sold a house today, are they able to have other living arrangements immediately, right? What is their criteria? What is their concerns? We're gonna discuss their qualifications, the market info, potential buyers and the competition on the market. And then we presented the market supply research, the price range availability and comparable homes for sale and talked about what price we would come on the market at. Okay. Um, so now you want to, um, you've present, you want to make sure you've presented your target market plan that you've hand handled or answered any questions and objections. And then we're going to work on securing the agreement on the best price range and um, and what their limits are. Okay, it might be a question too, as we're moving through that pricing strategy of asking them, you know, if we came on the market at 630 and ended up having to do a price adjustment, what would be your bottom line? Okay, my goal is to get you the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of hassle. But what does your bottom line look like on making sure that we get this home sold? I know you're on kind of a tight time frame to, to make sure that you get this one in the contract so that you can move forward on that new build or so that you can, um, you know, you're, you've got that job transfer coming up in three weeks and you really need this property sold so that you can buy your next one. What does your bottom line look like? Just so I have that and I know where we're at. Right. If they're like, oh, my bottom line is 630 and that's where we're coming on the market, then I may want to adjust if I think there's some wiggle room there that I could go a little higher so that there's that wiggle room available. OK. Um, then you're going to close for listing. So, right. So we're going to ask for their business. Is there anything that I've done today that would prevent you from wanting to list your property with me? Right. Ask questions like that. Demonstrate that you have the qualities of somebody with a can-do, assertive, positive attitude that can get their house sold, right? Ask questions. Know that when I ask you to sign this listing agreement, they're going to say yes, right? Is there anything that I've, are there any questions I haven't answered? Is there anything that I haven't gotten to today that would prevent you from listing your property with me? And then we're going to answer those objections. We're going to isolate and then answer those objections. Is there anything else that would prevent you, right? So if they're like, oh, well, yeah, we're meeting with somebody else tomorrow. Okay, well, besides that, is there any other reason you would choose not to list your property with me? Right, and they're like, well, no, like you answered all our questions, you're right in line with where we're thinking price-wise. We talked about timing and how to make that work and that we might need like a week in the property after the close of escrow and you address that. So no, I mean, you've addressed everything else and you seem like you would be, you know, fairly confident in getting our house sold. You're like, perfect. Tell you what, since everything's in line and you said that you would, you know, I've answered all your questions and that there's nothing preventing you from listing your property with me, except that appointment tomorrow with that other agent. Why don't I call that other agent for you and cancel it? And we can go ahead and wrap this up today. Right. And then you're going to call up Claudia and you'll be like, Claudia, Sorry, I met with the sellers of 123 Sample Street. They already signed the listing agreement with me and they wanted me to call and cancel your appointment tomorrow. I'm so sorry. And then Claudia is going to shed a little tear. Yeah, see, there we go. Shed tears and she's going to be sad. But now your sellers didn't have to do that. So they signed the listing agreement because they were not wanting to have to call and cancel on somebody else. And if they hadn't canceled on Claudia and Claudia showed up the next day and she's like, is there anything preventing you from listing your property with me? And they were like, well, we met with Amy yesterday and she was pretty fantastic. And we really liked her. But Claudia would be like, oh yeah, Amy, I know Amy. Absolutely. She is fantastic. But I tell you what, I'm here now and we can get the ball rolling. So why don't we go ahead and take care of this? And I'll call Amy and let her down gently. And then they'll be like, cool, great, right? So sometimes it's just that suggestion and whoever makes the suggestion of, hey, let me take care of that call for you. Now they don't have confrontation in their life and they're really excited about it, right? So never hesitate to make the call for them, ask the questions, and then you're going to complete the listing paperwork and obtain the signatures. I usually like to come into that listing appointment. I do recommend coming in with the listing agreement in hand so that you can sign and walk away with a signed listing agreement and make it done before they have a chance to think about it. You provided them with a copy of it already, so they've already had a chance to review it. Now they just need to sign it. 
fill it out in advance as much as possible, right? You can fill in their information, the brokerage information, all the little nuances that need to be filled in. You may leave the, the price blank on there until you have that pricing discussion and then you're gonna put it on there as well as the like when it's gonna actually go on the market. And then any other non-crucial paperwork can be handled electronically, right? So your DIA, your market conditions advisory, your statewide buyer and seller advisory. Um, Claudia, I'll look for some written scripts that I have for the listing presentation that I can share as well. There should also be some inside the one you, um, if you search listing presentation, but I will look for some of mine as well. Um, so all that other non-crucial paperwork you can send out for electronic signatures later. Um, if they're going to want to price it a little on the high side and you don't want to fire them before the listing gets started, then you can always write in automatic price reductions. Okay. Um, this will help to avoid stalling techniques. Like let's just give it one more week. We can explain the time versus price, right? The longer it sits on the market, the more likely it is that people are going to undercut it. Um, so some different scripts that you can use for that is we have agreed that 630 should be the initial asking price. If we do not have at least 10 showings within the first two weeks, do I have your agreement to adjust the price to 625, right? You don't have to be drastic, just enough to pop it back up on people's radars again. Um, thinking of it like something that goes on sale, right? It always attracts us as consumers, right? We all love a sale. And since the actual selling price will come down to what a buyer is willing to pay and what you are willing to take, we can only adjust the price a little at a time until we hit that magic number, right? Let me explain. The magic number is not the selling price. It is the asking price at which a buyer feels comfortable making an offer. You will notice that I've written in our listing agreement that the price will automatically be reduced by $3,000 every two calendar weeks, but not go below 620,000. Will that work for you? Right? And they're gonna be like, Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So every two weeks, if we don't have showings, we should expect a $3,000 price reduction, but it's not gonna be go below our ceiling of 620. Yes, that absolutely makes sense to me. Perfect, right? So you can write that into your listing agreement so it's already in there. That's what they're referring to as the magic number script. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Fabulous. Then we're going to move into those closes, right? Perfect. Let's take care of the paperwork or let's pencil that out on paper and make it a deal, right? And then we're always, before we wrap up that listing appointment, we're going to let them know when to expect to hear from us next. Perfect. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. I'm excited to get your house sold. Please make sure you'll get an email from my transaction coordinator. Um, her name is Melina, and she's going to be sending you some additional documents to sign. Those documents were included with that pre-listing package. It's going to include things like the disclosure information advisory that talks about the things that need to be disclosed on the property. It's also going to um, send over the statewide buyer and seller advisory, just advising you on what kind of inspections a buyer may have on the property or you as a seller may want to have. Um, we talked about those pre-listing inspections. So I'm going to get those scheduled. We're about a month out from going on the market based on your time frame and what we talked about. So those inspections, we'll probably have those done in about two weeks. That gives us time, um, you know, to kind of you get to prepare the property for market. And then it still gives us time that there are some minor things that you may want to fix on those inspections. It gives us time that we can remedy any items that may pop up that you want to be taken care of before a buyer sees the property. In addition, in about two weeks, you're gonna see a sign pop up in the yard and that'll be your for sale sign. We're gonna market the property as a coming soon listing to help build anticipation and let potential buyers that are in the market know that your property is coming. So if they have been waiting for a property like yours in this neighborhood, they don't move on another property instead. Does that make sense? And we'd be like, oh yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely, right? So we're gonna set them up for success. Hey, you're getting this email. We're gonna get inspections scheduled. I will touch base with you here in a couple of days just to firm up all of our plans and make sure our timeline and everything looks right for photos and those, those pre-listing inspections. So you should expect to hear from me on Thursday. Does that make sense? And you'll be like, cool, absolutely. And you'll be like, is it better for me to call you in the morning or the afternoon? Right? So, right, we're going to set them up for the expectation. What's going to happen next? If you can't get the listing agreement signed and they're like, man, 
we were really looking forward to meeting with Claudia tomorrow. And I don't want to let her down because I know she probably got her hopes up at meeting with us and we don't want to hurt her feelings. Be like, great. What time's your appointment with Claudia tomorrow? I'll be there. No, I'm joking. Don't say you'll be there. Um, they're gonna be like, oh, it's at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Be like, perfect. Um, I will touch base with you tomorrow early evening just to see how that appointment went and to see if I can go ahead and send that listing agreement over for electronic signatures. Does that work for you? And you'll be like, yeah, that, that works. Absolutely. Right. So we're just going to set that up for here's the next time I'm touching base with you. And then you better make sure you pop that in your calendar with a reminder so that you don't miss your check in. Anybody have questions? No, <laughs> no. Go in with the assumption that you're getting the listing. Unless you walk into the property and you're like, I don't want this. You couldn't touch. I wouldn't touch this listing with a 10 foot pole. Right. Um, make sure you have relationships with handymen and contractors in case there's work they're wanting to get done. And oftentimes some of the questions you get asked by sellers is, well, we were thinking about updating the kitchen before we went on market. Does that make sense? Right. That's why I come in with, well, here's our, our price range and here's what it would sell for without a new kitchen. And here's what it'd sell for with a new kitchen. And what's that price spread and how much is that kitchen going to cost you? If they're going to spend 30 or $40,000 on a brand new kitchen, which is what it's going to cost. If you have somebody else come in and do a kitchen remodel for you, it probably doesn't make sense. It's probably going to be a wash ultimately. And so you just want to be able to advise them in that manner as well, where, you know, maybe replacing the carpet because it smells like cat pee and it's disgusting and it's still mauve carpet from the early nineties. That may make sense to replace the carpet for, you know, $5,000. They replaced the carpet. And now they've bumped the value on the house, probably 10 grand because it smells good and it looks pretty. Okay. So make sure you kind of have, be building those relationships with contractors and carpet people and flooring people and handymen so that you have people in your pocket that can take care of those items that the sellers need to take care of. Okay. Um, Claudia, I will look for scripts and I'll send you a link to that uh, Google form that I have. It's really fabulous because it fills out the information. You send the link to the sellers and they can go in there and fill out all the information and it's an order of how you put it into the MLS. So it makes it really easy when you go to input that information. And oftentimes when we input information to the MLS, we're guessing, we're like, um, well, I was there and it seemed like it was pretty close to the ground. So I'm pretty sure it's a slab foundation. Let me look at the last listing or, well, what was the siding? I think it was like siding, not stucco, but I don't know what it was made out of. So now the sellers are answering all those questions so that we're not guessing on the answers. So if there's misinformation, it's their fault, not mine. Woohoo, right? And it asks some questions like, hey, how much is their HOA or how much is their average water bill or how much is their average PG&E bill? Do they have solar? Do they have a pool? And it's really cool because like if they're like, yes, I have solar, then it takes them to the solar section. And if they say, no, I don't have solar, then it skips that solar section. So it's a smart form. It took me a while to set it up, but I'm really proud of it. So I'll share a link to that form so that you guys can um, make a copy of it and use it for your own if you want to. And I'll look up some of those listing scripts. Um, anything anybody else wants? Fabulous. Well, thank you for joining me today, everyone. Tomorrow at four, we are covering how to do a CMA report or comparative market analysis inside of Berries and how to pull it in the cloud CMA. In the chat box is the link to log your attendance. Um, next week, we don't have class on Wednesday. And I don't remember what we're covering. I looked at it a minute ago, but now it's poof, God, let's, let's see. Maybe I can pull it up. All right, on next week, we are covering the residential listing agreement on Tuesday, no class on Wednesday. And then we're gonna talk about those free tools that you have available, like list reports and home light and glide that you can utilize to make yourself more efficient and effective as an agent, especially with listings. All righty. Everybody have a fabulous day and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you, Amy. Absolutely.